his photos put humanity front and centre, be it in times of war or peace. Steve McCurry's image of a young Afghan girl made the cover of National Geographic in the 1980s, catapulting him to fame and bringing the conflict there to the world's attention. Since then, the photojournalist has captured faces, figures and landscapes across the globe. Now the Mayol Museum in Paris is paying tribute to one of the great image makers of our time in an exhibition entitled The World of Steve McCurry. Steve McCurry, hello. This retrospective covers decades, continents, a whole range of human experiences. And when you look at your body of work brought together in this way, is there something that becomes apparent, an element that sticks out for you? Well, for me, uh, looking at the pictures, I, I kind of see more of the, this sort of incredible world that we live in this planet uh, and, and this sort of common humanity that we share and whether you're in, you know, Myanmar or you know Jordan, uh, we, we kind of, I, I always feel like we're just kind of one, you know, race, and um, and and it's just, I just marvel at the variety. For me, it's been a, an incredible experience to go to these places, learn about different cultures, meet different people, and I thought, you know, what better way to use my time in this world than to travel and see the world. Uh, I can't imagine anything more uh, sort of you know, inspiring or anything more that that's, uh, gives my life meaning and fulfillment. Some of the first images we see in this exhibition are from Afghanistan some 40 years ago when you crossed into the country from Pakistan. Around 1979, uh, just before the Soviets uh, invaded, you won the Robert Kappa Gold Award for your reporting there. It brought your work to international attention. Looking back at that time, what was it that prompted you to make that very dangerous trip? Was it curiosity or your instinct for a big story? Well, I was in a hotel in, up in northern Pakistan. It was very, it was like, a, a one or two dollar night or, uh, a night room. And there were some Afghan refugees, refugees living in the next room. And we would talk and we had an occasional lunch together and they kept telling me about this war that was this, this fight that was happening across the border. And they, they said, you know, you're, you're a photographer. Uh, you should come in and tell our story. We want to take you in and, and show you what's happening. And I was a bit reluctant. I thought, well, I've never been to an area of conflict uh, this is probably not safe, I, you know. But they kept insisting, and I thought, well, you know, this is th this is an important story. These farmers and shepherds fighting for their way of life and for their their country against this uh, the government. So I thought, and I was young, I was you know, a sense of adventure. I thought th th this is something I should probably do. So I, I agreed, and I went in, and. Um, and as I, I, I was going from village to village, staying in their homes, uh, getting to know them, they, they had a great sense of humor. Uh, and we, um, uh, I, 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 the, the story sort of, I got attached to the story and I went back sort of over and over again for the next sort of 30 years. A few years after that, your portrait of Sharbat Gullah became an icon of late 20th century photography. That National Geographic cover changed your life and hers to a certain extent. And I believe she was only about 13 years old when you photographed her in a refugee camp in Pakistan. How do you think that image changed people's perception of what it was or what it is to be a refugee? Well, at that time, the Afghans were desperate for help. And I think the world was very sympathetic to their, to their cause. Uh, they wanted food, uh, you know, tents and clothing, and the, the fighters, the Mojadeen, wanted weapons. I think they, people saw on her face uh, a little girl that had a, a dignity that was holding her head high. Um, there was a sense of perseverance, fortitude, that somehow she wasn't going to yield to this, uh, even despite that she was obviously poor. And uh, you know her shawl was ripped, uh, and she had a dirt on her face. I think there was a genuine quality to the picture which people connected with, and the, that powerful gaze that you know 
I'm going to survive this. Somehow I'm going to endure. Now, having lost contact with her, I believe you reconnected almost 20 years after that photograph was taken. And she, in the intervening years, her move back to Afghanistan. Sharbat Gullah was recently forced to leave again, I believe, seeking asylum in Italy. And that story of forced exile is one that so many Afghans share. But what did she teach you about the condition, particularly of women in Afghan society? Well, it's a very conservative culture. Um, I, I think that just the fact that she's been able to survive uh, with her family, you know, as we know, her husband passed away, uh, but she still has that strength to carry on. Uh, I think that you know, life can be very difficult, but the only thing we can really do is just move forward in a positive way. And I think she's an example of somebody who's just going to press forward and, and under the circumstances do the best she can. As you mentioned, Afghanistan became an, a hugely important part of your work and also your life. You made many trips there in the last uh, 40 years. When you saw the uh, Taliban take over in August as the US forces left the country, did you see that as inevitable? I think I, I knew that it was inevitable that the Taliban were going to take over 10 years ago. In the beginning, back in like 2002, 2000, it, it looked like this was a new chapter, that Afghanistan was finally coming out of this dark period. And as time went on, it was clear that the people in the countryside were not on board with this thing. A lot of corruption, uh, you know, the haves and have-nots, there was this big, huge gap. And uh, there were a lot of people upset about the drones and, you know, people kicking in their doors at 2 o'clock in the morning. So I think that um, it was clear. The thing which was uh, the shock was that it happened so quickly. And I think that there was a sense once, you know, the Americans sort of pulled out, I think people thought, realized that the party was over. Um, no support, no money. And I think the thing just came unraveled in, in a, just a matter of days. And so your heart goes out to people who had, during that period, helped whatever, you know, foreign people were there, the New Zealanders, the Americans, and on and on, the French, everybody. And I, they were just trying to make ends meet. It's just such a sad, tragic, heartbreaking situation. And uh, what's the next step? Are, are the international community going to help? Or are they going to step away? Uh, hopefully, the, some of the money will, that being tied up will be freed, because this is only hurting you know, ordinary Afghans. It's, I think there's going to be ha a lot of individual effort that's going to have to take place. And I'm not sure we can rely so much on our governments, because they haven't done a very good job in the past. Your photographs often show the triumph of the human spirit, uh, dignity, determination, uh, resilience, often in the harshest possible circumstances. I wondered where this optimism comes from, how you manage to convey this optimism through the, the people you meet and the places you go to. Well, when you're, when you're in a, a difficult situation, when you're, I mean, I'm thinking about kind of being under fire in Afghanistan, and how you're there, sometimes the, the strangest thing, the acts of kindness and humor will occur at the oddest times. And um, I think that it's, uh, for me, it's always such a surprise when in a difficult situation, when you know, the, the human spirit is being crushed, uh, somebody will step forward and bring a bit of lightness to the situation. I guess I'm looking for these glimmers of hope and optimism, sometimes at the worst possible circumstances. Children are often among the most memorable figures in your photography. Uh, a recent book is entitled Portraits of Innocence, and that focuses on your youngest subjects. What is it about children that makes them so photogenic? Well, uh, children are so kind of spontaneous and innocent. They're uncontrollable, you, you, uh, and they're so free. They're uninhibited. <laughs> and, they're, it, they're, you know, their curiosity and they're, they're just these free spirits. And uh, I know with my daughter, uh, sometimes she wants to be photographed, sometimes she doesn't. But she's always doing something which is just so, uh, so much fun. And, and 
I, I would say, though, that there are children in the world who are less fortunate. And in my book, I, I talk about, I, I show child labor and some children who are you know, refugees or children of war. And um, you know, you think at this time, at this day and age, we, we should do be a, able to do better for these children. And, and they should be given a kind of a normal childhood, not sent to work in a factory at you know, 10 years old. You've covered Asia, Africa, South America, pretty much everywhere in the world. Where's next? What's the next uh, photographic project that's calling your name? Well, I like to go back to the same places over and over again. That's one of, you know, I've, I haven't been everywhere in the world, but I've been to the places that I've wanted to travel to. I, I was planning to go back to Myanmar in February, but that doesn't look like, like it's going to happen because of the pandemic and also, also the, this unrest that's happening. I have a number of friends in, in Myanmar, and I wanted to go back and see them, see what we could do to help uh, in this sort of very desperate time. Uh, but uh, so much of the world is closed, Africa, you know, much of Asia, South America. Uh, so I'll probably end up just doing something uh, in my own neighborhood <laughs> at home. Steve McCurry, thank you very much. It was a pleasure, thank you.